Greetings, I'm Professor Trevor Miller, and I hope you're finding this course interesting. This week, we'll be discussing World War II, the conditions that led to World War II, the rise of Hitler, uh, America's involvement in World War II, productivity and production, women on the home front, women in the WASPs, and we're going to be discussing uh, the combat operations as well as the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So from your textbook this week, you should be reading chapter 25, United States and the Second World War, 1939 to 1945. In this image, you'll see Pointe du Hoc. This is a location in Normandy, France, that our American troopers scaled while being shot at and shelled and, and bombed uh, during World War II, during the uh, invasion of Normandy, France. So again, this information is merely meant to supplement your reading, not to replace it. But by the end of reading, you should be able to answer these questions. Mainly, how did Americans' foreign policy change uh, as World War II uh, impacted them? Uh, how, did, how did America mobilize for war? What did the war mean on the home front? And then how did our allies and our involvement on the world stage help to win the war and find uh, why was the U U.S. emerging as a superpower at the end of the war? Many scholars believe that the conditions that led to World War II were created immediately after World War I, specifically during the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. Our allies imposed such stiff penalties on Germany that Germany had no way to recover from these penalties. When, combined with the Great Depression that occurred worldwide, Germany was crippled. Their economy was reduced uh, to, to, to insignificance as they were once a great power. And this gave rise to the dissident Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party. He was elected chancellor of Germany. And as Hitler rose to power, Hitler blamed the Jews, the Jewish population of Europe, for World War I. Um, he blamed the Jews for Germany's loss during World War I, and he blamed the failure of Germany's recovery, economic recovery, after World War II specifically on the Jews. Now, Germany then aligns itself, the Hitler's new government, aligns itself with the fascist governments of Italy and Japan. As we move forward, we need to ask ourselves, what is a fascist? And we're going to spend the next several slides discussing what a fascist is. So to help define fascism, I found this from Marquette Law School. And Marquette Law School notes that a fascist government can be any form of government. This can be a democracy, a communist country, a socialist country. It doesn't matter the platform of the country that any country can become a fascist country. Now, what separates a fascist country from other countries? We're going to cover that right now. First, they're militaristic. The country places great emphasis on the military and military strength, military identity. They're nationalistic, meaning they place their country, the importance of their country, before others. They consider their country to be the greatest or supreme country on the planet. They are committed to a strong leader, a figurehead, a symbol, someone who is going to guide them, to lead them. They are also biased against selected minorities. They tightly control business and corporate power to help strengthen and embolden their vision of what their country should be. And then once they're in power, they tend to dominate the economy, they dominate the media so only their message gets out, and then they change social norms within the country to help reflect their identity. So Dr. Papke here from Marquette Law School identifies that as one rises to power as a fascist, they help give a narrative that the country needs to be reborn, recreated in their image, that the country used to be something amazing, and then it went wrong. Uh, the country was uh, uh, undermined by nefarious groups, by populations within it. They blame someone or something, a group within the population, for the ills 
of the decline of that country. And then now is the time to strike back at these people, these individuals, these groups within the country and take charge to make the country what it should be. So as conditions brewed in Europe for World War II, we have to consider that Japan had fought the Russians on the Japanese Rusko War. And after this, Japan became the dominant force in the Pacific. Germany violated the Treaty of Versailles and created an offensive army in the Rhineland. Russia went through its coup uh, and became a communist country and consolidated its military power as well. They became a titan of military strength in Europe. European colonies around the world began to have problems in civil unrest, and then in 1931, Japan invades China and conquers most of the country. Throughout this entire time period, FDR was committed that America would stay neutral, that we had fought the war to end all wars, and we were not going to get involved. As Japan approaches its attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, Japan used American policies as propaganda to help gain support for a war on America, specifically um, the Chinese Exclusion Act to uh, exclude Asian uh, peoples from immigrating to the United States were used against America. Then Japan enters the Tripartite Pact. Uh, it's a defensive treaty with Germany and Italy, meaning that they will come to each other's aid if one of the other is attacked. As Japan sought to expand its, its empire further into Southwest Pacific, um, FDR imposed a trade embargo specifically limiting uh, oil and steel, uh, and that completely hampered Japan's uh, reach throughout the region. This enraged uh, the Japanese leaders, and this will roll into the attack on Pearl Harbor. Approach Pearl Harbor, we need to ask the question, uh, were there warning signs that this could have been avoided? Uh, was there any type of, of information that could have led to the United States acting differently and possibly preventing the deaths of uh, 2,400 uh, men, women, and children that died in the attack on Pearl Harbor? And the answer to that question is yes. So in NSA reports that have been un unclassified for many years, before Pearl Harbor uh, occurred, months before Pearl Harbor occurred, the British intelligence service, their James Bond service, right, their foreign service, uh, intercepted communications that indicated that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked by the Japanese. However, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of England, decided not to tell its number one ally, England, uh, excuse me, the United States, of this pending attack because it was Churchill's goal to get America to enter the war. So here our ally, our greatest ally, is not sharing information that could have prevented not only the deaths of the people at Pearl Harbor, but could have prevented the deaths of many more Americans as World War II approached was attacked unprovoked. Uh, they sent no communications directly to the United States indicating that they were going to attack our military installation. And many, many, many Americans were killed in their unawares uh, in, in, the, in the early morning attack. Americans were shocked by Pearl Harbor. Never in their history had Americans been attacked, had the homeland been attacked, had, had innocent people been killed in such devastation as what unfolded on Pearl Harbor. So in response, millions of men and women enlisted or were commissioned in the United States military. During this time period, we have to consider that women were barred from all combat service and minorities were usually segregated away from white troops. However, while women were barred from combat service, this organization, the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, was created to help enable and train U.S. forces. These women 
had to get their own pilot's license, pay their own money to travel to training, to uh, get the training from the military. Once they were certified by the military to fly, they didn't receive combat pay. If they were killed, which many of them were, killed in, the, in this course of their duties, they did not receive military honors. They didn't receive military funerals. They weren't given uh, benefits as a, as a or for, or for performing the same duties as a man. They flew more than 60 million miles, many of them through strict and harsh conditions. Uh, many of them uh, had, to, had to go through strict and, and, and harsh combat-like environments where they couldn't serve in combat facing an enemy, but to train U.S. artillery, they were often shot at by U.S. soldiers to help train the artillerymen on how to hit aircraft in the air. These women performed vital roles uh, in uh, to support combat all around the world, and they were largely ignored and marginalized. Here, we covered America's entry into the war, we covered the conditions that led to World War II, and then we focused very briefly on the WASPs. Now, the war is much more broader in scope and size, and much more is going to be covered over the next lesson. I hope you're having a wonderful week, and again, I hope you're learning a great deal from this course. Best wishes.